here we are. So one important issue to address is the fight against human trafficking. And, um, and the fight against human trafficking is a very uncomfortable topic. But today we're gonna to talk about the grooming tactics that are used in human trafficking to exploit and manipulate vulnerable individuals. And today's special guest is Sherry Lopez, who's going to share with us her unique insights, her experience with grooming as a survivor of human trafficking. Welcome, Sherry. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I agree with you. This is a very uncomfortable topic. People don't want to talk about it, let alone really hear about it. But it's important because all of our children can be groomed. So let me share with you a little bit about my journey through trafficking. So I was 15 years old. I had just started my high school years and a young man befriended me uh, who I call Carl. That's not his real name, but that's what I call him. Uh, and he befriended me. And because I didn't have any brothers, I didn't understand the language that boys spoke. And because he was paying attention to me, I truly thought he was interested in me, which I think is very common in all generations. It doesn't matter if you're 60 years old or you're 15 years old, it, the pattern is the same. When you're in your adolescent years, you're looking and exploring companionship and looking for a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a significant other. With me though, I was extremely vulnerable because now I didn't grow up in a bad home. And so I always have to share with people that it doesn't matter the environment that the child is living in because that doesn't matter. Is it how a groomer looks for how moldable a child is? How easy can they convince the child that they're their friend or an ally? So I grew up in a, in a upper class, two parent home, professional parents, and I was the middle of two girls. And um, we were good kids. My older sister excelled. My younger sister had some learning challenges. And I didn't have anything that made me stand out, so I was just kind of there. But my parents always just assumed that everything was okay with us girls because we weren't having fights in the home. We weren't causing any problems. We No school official was calling. We weren't in trouble with the law. So they assumed everything was fine. Yeah. What I did is I, I hibernated in my room because I didn't have anything that made me stand out that uh, brought attention to my parents where maybe I would have had more qualified or quality time with my parents. And um, never to blame my parents, but I do think that parents need to realize that just because you have well-behaved children or quiet children, you still need to spend time with them and find out what's going on in their world and really investigate. Because not all child, children that are being groomed are going to talk about it. Yeah, and, and I want you to tell us what grooming is and how it is connected to human trafficking because a lot of words are just thrown out there, but I don't think people take time to investigate the deeper meanings mm -hmm. behind these words relative to how it plays out in the stuff that is happening after the programming, after the mind control. You know what I mean? So if you could just walk us through what grooming is and how it and how it plays a role in human trafficking and also touch on the programming and the mind control. How are all these things interconnected? Sure. In short, grooming is preparing a child to be sold. Trafficking is the action of selling the child. But grooming can involve many layers depending upon how much time the groomer wants to spend with the child. So grooming is a person that's going to befriend you in some way, gain your trust, 
allow you to view them as a friend, not a threat, somebody that initially does not harm you and acts like they care about you. They often will fit themselves into a role as a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a significant other, or if someone is trying to groom the family to get into, let's say, a single parent home, they're going to spend a lot of time flattering the parent, um, acting disinterested in the children. They're going to want to eventually spend time alone with the children after they have gained trust. And that's the whole thing. The whole part of grooming is gaining the trust of either the child they're grooming or a parent they're trying to groom to get to their children. And it's a slow process. You can, this can apply in so many ways. You, you meet somebody that you think might be a good friend to you, but you don't know them. And so you build that relationship in a friendship way. And then over time you become friends and you start to trust that person. That's kind of an example of what it's like in grooming. So my grooming process was three months long. It took three months for Carl's father, who did the grooming and the trafficking, to mentally get control of me, not through threat, through friendship, solidarity, filling in the voids that I was missing. I didn't have brothers, so he identified himself as the brother I never had. He said nobody would mess with me in school. He had my back. So he presented himself as a protector. Yeah. And you're talking, as you're talking, I thought of the motivations and behaviors of the perpetrators. Because a lot of people think it's something other than what you have just described. And I wanted just to interject so that maybe you can also delve into that. I know you yet talk about the programming aspect of it. You started touching on it. You know, it took you three months. It was a slow process. There was no view, you know, it was just really friendship, you know, mm -hmm. affection, building trust, but you, you touched on the behavior and the motivations of the perpetrator. And if you could just, you know, um, touch on that a little bit more as you go along. Sorry. Sure. The motivator behind the action is to eventually get the child in a position where you control their actions and insert fear. For, compliance, for them to be compliant. That's what it was. Uh, and then they switch. So a groomer usually is a very nice person, not always in some cases, but in my case it was. But then when he was ready to sell me, he switched to a completely different personality. He was very scary and uh, that, that confused me. And even in that confusion, I was extremely vulnerable there, which they were able to use to their advantage. So somebody who is working to manipulate a child who is vulnerable, they take their time. They look. So, for example, somebody who is grooming online, and there are people that do that, they could be talking to 20 different children all at the same time to find just that one. So they're fishing. They're trying to find that one child that is posting something like, oh, I hate my parents. I don't wanna live. Nobody likes me. And kids are very free about sharing their emotions online. And so a groomer looks for those types of comments and then will start the process of trying to groom them uh, to eventually meet and then traffic. This is so important. And if you're listening, you're a parent, please don't be shy to share this with your children. And the reason why I'm saying that you should share this with your children is because sometimes children receive a message from a stranger or an auntie or an uncle or a neighbor or their peers faster than they will receive it from you. Mm -hmm. And it's just, is you know, your mom and your dad. So she's really telling you what we know a lot of teenagers say. I mean, we all, every, every teenager looks at their parents like, you wouldn't let me go to the party? I mean, really, I hate you, right? <laughs> but unfortunately, the groomers are already building a profile. This is very important, people. 
your, your, your temper tantrums, hormones, teenage hormones, the changes, hormonal changes going on, social media pressure. These kids are living in a whole different world. Yeah. They're very vulnerable. And you mentioned something very interesting, which got me thinking about the cost of trafficking, because you said when he sold me, um, his demeanor totally changed. And I thought about, I was like, okay, of course, because trafficking, maybe some people know it, some may not know, but trafficking is a very lucrative business. Mm -hmm. The cost of human trafficking is very profitable. Can you touch on this? And what it means to be sold, because I don't think people know what is going on, you know, when you say sold, you know right. what I mean? They think, are you yeah. getting money? Are you getting a cut off? Are you getting, you know what I mean? What is going on? Mm -hmm. It's so hard to comprehend that another human will actually sell a human for profit. You know, in this day and age, that's just, uh, it's uncomprehendable, but that's what's happening our, to our children day in and day out. So when you enter a trafficking phase, your trafficker, which is a nicer word for pimp, a lot of people can relate to the word pimp. So that person is the one that arranges so-called, they're called dates. So they sound like common terms that we hear every day. So the trafficker will arrange a date, which means that an adult over the age of 18 is going to want to have sex with that minor. And then the minor is taken to the location. Money okay, is- minor, we're talking about what age? And, well, here in, in the US, age of consent is 18. So a minor under the age of 18. Anybody under the age of 18 is considered a minor. Yes, I don't know. Yeah, in the United States, it's that way. I'm not sure what the laws it is. It varies in different countries in right. Europe. Um, some countries it's 16 and some it's 15 and some are fighting to get it lower. That's conversation for another show. Right. But, yeah. but the fact is that money is being exchanged for the act of having sex with anybody. That is trafficking. It doesn't matter truly if you're a minor or you're an adult. If somebody is controlling you through force, fraud, or coercion, and money is being exchanged, or it could even be drugs, it could be something else, it doesn't always have to be money that is changing hand from the person that's buying, let's say in this child, the, chi the child uh, for sex and the, the trafficker. So in my case, as a child at the time that this started, when I was 15, uh, I didn't even see money exchange hands for a long, long time. I never saw any of that happen. Uh, but eventually I did when I was sold to other traffickers. So it's taking a child who is basically a commodity, like something that you would just pick off of the shopping store shelf. A person puts it in the cart and says, oh, I want to buy that person. And they pay the money and then they leave. So that's kind of how it is. The quickest way that I can put it into a reality term. Yeah. And how has social media changed the game for the traffickers? Oh, goodness. Social media was the biggest gift to a, a groomer and a trafficker. So when I mentioned earlier about online communications, a groomer who is fishing and looking for another child to groom is um, often using a fake profile, a fake picture of an attractive person somewhere around the age of the child that they're trying to groom. So that will intrigue the child they're trying to communicate with to start a conversation. So many, many times it's not even, it's not the real person behind the screen. It's, it's a complete fake image, fake story, fake everything all to get the child to start a conversation and then over time they it's the strangest thing how you can become friends with somebody online when you don't really know anything about them but they feed you a groomer will feed the child what the child needs to hear to build the child up and then they'll invite them to meet and then that's what happens in those cases where the child will meet up 
with the person that's trying to groom them. And in this case, they may just be taken and thrown into the trafficking world. In my situation, the internet was just coming in. So that wasn't a tool that my groomer had. So he had to invest in spending time with me day in and day out to build that trust. So uh, parents need to be parents. They, um, you can be a friend with your child when they're older, but you need to know what your kids are up to. You need to know what apps they're on. You need to know who they're talking to. You need to know who they're, they're meeting. They could say they're going to their friend's house for the night and really leave their phone there and go somewhere else. So even if you have like a location tracker on your child's phone, the child leaves it behind, let's say at their friend's house and goes somewhere else. You don't know where they are. So parents need to follow up on where their children are, talk to the parents of where their children say they're going to be and be okay with saying no to your children and taking those devices away. Um, if you don't, you're just kind of inviting trouble, you know? I, I just, it breaks my heart every time I think about it. So I'm working with a family right now. The young girl is 13 and we're trying to intervene to get her away from this man who is in the beginning stages of grooming her. So this young girl is 13 and the gentleman is 40 and she truly believes that he loves her. Yeah. And she truly believes that this man loves her. Of and course, she's 13. Yes. Her, her idea of love. Well, every young girl wants to have the latest and greatest fashion, purse, shoes, whatever it may be. So a family often can't provide those things for their children. The parents can't. It, it's, it's hard to raise kids financially. So someone who is older can provide those things a lot of times. A groomer because they are in the trafficking world, what's the selling the child, they have money. So they will spend money on the child that they're trying to groom, which is to prepare them to sell. They will spend money on them. They will provide them with a Louis Vuitton purse, you know, fancy shoes, whatever the child is wanting. And the groomer in the beginning will say, no, I'm doing it because I love you. I know you deserve these things. I'm sorry your parents can't take care of you. They can't give you these things, but I love you more. So I'm going to do these things to you and give these things to you and show how much I love you. And you know, every young girl wants to be told how much they're loved. And even young boys. I always refer to girls just because, you know, that was my experience. But it happens with the boys too. It does happen with the boys and actually yeah we mentioned when we talked earlier that it's actually under documented the boys the, the grooming in boys is heavily under reported and under documented this mm -hmm. has a lot to do with several factors which we wouldn't get into but it is very much there you know mm -hmm. and you mentioned one technique and that is a gift buying expensive gifts um and you also mentioned um trying to be like the parent replacement, this friend that you want your parents to be when they're busy parenting. So these are some of the techniques that they use, people. So pay attention. Mm -hmm. Also young ones listening and women as well, grown-ups as well. These are mm -hmm. the techniques can be used on you as well. Because if you have gone through a lot of trauma, heavy trauma, and you're in a very vulnerable state or you're having, facing financial difficulties, these people can still slide in. So this is... We are focusing on the children because that is mostly Sher uh, Sherry's story. But you can also take these, this message and this knowledge for adults as well. And, and Sherry, I was just wondering as you were talking, are there special environments that, you know, is there like a special, are there like certain specific environments and areas that are more conducive for grooming and trafficking? 
Uh, it's hard to say. There's always the thought that if a child comes from a poor environment or is in what we call the foster care system, or they are runaway or troubled kids, that they're more vulnerable. And I agree, they are. But also at the same time, I don't want parents to become comfortable and think that, okay, my child doesn't fall into any of those categories, so I'm good, my kids are safe, this is not a threat to my family. And that's not true because again, I came from a pretty wealthy home. I came from stability. I had what I wanted. I didn't, you know, I had what I needed. I should say I didn't always get what I wanted, but I had what I needed. I was well taken care of. I was not a runaway. I didn't get into trouble. So I don't want parents to think that, oh, okay. Mom and dad are working, making good money. Uh, our child is not wanting for anything that they too could not be groomed because they can. And I, I don't say this to scare parents, but to put reality into the fact that you need to pay more attention to what your kids are doing. You know who need to know who their friends are. You need to really stay on top of social media. That is that's where this grooming is happening now. Never allow your child to have any type of electronic device behind closed door doors where you can't see what they're doing. Uh, I know a lot of homework is done on computers or tablets now. Well, have them do that in the kitchen or where you can watch what they're doing while you're preparing a meal. Um, Take their phones away at night. Dock all of the social media apps. Let them charge in one central location or in the parent's room. The kids don't need them. Uh, and a lot of this stuff happens at night. So there is no reason that a child needs to be chatting to somebody at 11 o'clock at night in their room with the door shut. That's just an invitation for trouble. Sherry, I'm going to ask a question I'm sure you've been asked a thousand times, or you have seen the manifestation of this perspective of people's lives, the perception that they are okay. This cannot happen to them. My mm -hmm. children are safe. They are fine. They are raised well. We are not the kind of family that can be trafficked. Our children don't do drugs. They don't take alcohol. They're good. You know what I mean? Why is this the case and how can we make the parents get it that people who are trafficked, I know you've shared your story, you've repeated it three times, the family background, the social status, it's mm -hmm. not a poverty thing, it's not a crime mm -hmm. thing, it's not a neighborhood thing, it's mm -hmm. not a bad parent thing, hard home, traumatized, abusive home, it's none of those, but how can we drill it in? that you really need to, you know, step it up because the traffickers are having a field day and you mentioned social media and right. how they're thriving there. You know, you teach your children how to safely drive a car and you invest in teaching the child how to do that. But what is lacking is the safety and learning how to use social media and teaching children to only communicate with people that they truly know and for parents to understand that trafficking is a lucrative, lucrative business. And so mm -hmm. groomers and traffickers are looking, are always looking for a new child to groom because as sad and as sick as this is, a trafficked child has an expiration date. Say a trafficker has five girls that she's tr she or he is trafficking, and the buyers have gone through and bought all of those children. So the groomer has to go out there and look for other children to groom so that they can maintain their clientele. You have to think of this in a business term. These people are mentally sick, yes, but is a business to them. 
So they have to find other children to replace the children that they are currently trafficking so that they can continue to sell to the person that wants to buy them. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's got to make sense because it's really, you know, when you, you know, we're still talk, we're talking about children here. Yes. You know, and it's really mind boggling, but this is happening people. And, you know, I can't say it enough just because you, you know, you, what you do the ostrich thing, you put, you bury your head in the sun does mm -hmm. not mean it goes away. The mm -hmm. traffickers are running a very, very lucrative business and it's a network. It's not one person doing this. And, and you know what, as you were talking, Sherry, I was thinking back, at, you know, about your story because you're talking about, you know, you, you know, we shared the age at which you were groomed, the process, and then to the process in which, you know, given the thought that, that you were, you were sold. And then there was an angel who came in. Now I know the backstory, but I'd like you to share this story because it might make people, you know, gain confidence, you know, in the fact that they can do something, you know, right. and, and how little it takes to save a life. You know what I mean? Yes. And I wrote something down, which as you're talking, I'd like you to touch on this. And this is patience and grace. Mm -hmm. So if you could just touch, I know where that's coming from, but if you could share that with our audience, that would be magical. I know it's a magical moment when you share that, it might hit home. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So starting, I groomed at 15. When I turned 18, I was sold to three other traffickers. So I had my expiration date. So when I was sold to the last trafficker, uh, I earned the privilege of going to get the mail at the mailbox at the apartment complex that I was at. Who would think that's a privilege? But for me, it was. I was behaving and I was complicit. And so every time I would go there, I would see this older woman and she was nice and kind and paid attention to what was happening around her and in the apartment complex. And over time, she befriended me. And it's so funny because she gained my trust, but I'm not sure why she gained my trust other than I sensed inside that she was a way out. So on a particular day, in fact, this March is the month that I was rescued from trafficking. So this is a very special month to me. Wow. And um, the woman's name was Pearl. And she was what we would probably consider now a nosy neighbor. But I encourage everybody to be a nosy neighbor. Pay attention to who lives on your street, the cars that are normal, the people that kind of come and go so that you can spot if something is out of sorts and then call the police um, to have them come check it out. But Pearl would be at the mailbox. And that's how uh, I got the name for my nonprofit in honor of Pearl. It's called Pearl at the mailbox. And one day I'd had a really significant punishment for not having good service. And she was at the mailbox when I went to collect the mail and she asked me if I was ready to go. And I walked away with her. God put her in my path to save me because prior to walking away with Pearl, I started having dreams that if I did not get out, I really was going to die. Even though there were many times that I should have died with, with the beatings and guns to my head and, drugs forced in my body. Uh, I should not be here talking to you, but that angel Pearl, she rescued me and I walked away with her and I am one of the lucky ones. There are so many people that are trafficked and they'll, they will remain missing because they're probably not alive. And because of Pearl, I have an obligation to share what happened to me to try and prevent other children from falling into the traps that I did and to open up the eyes to parents and guardians and family members in general that 
this is happening all around the world. It has been happening with the internet. It, it's worse. It's the it's a business for these traffickers and they make money and they're looking for more kids to manipulate and then to sell. And once you're in the selling part, the trafficking part, it's really hard to get out because uh, blackmail is used. So uh, everything that happened to me was recorded. So that was blackmail because people always ask, well, why didn't you just walk away? It's not that easy, especially once you have your mind is controlled and you're so fearful that if you breathe without permission, you're going to get backhanded or you're going to get punched. Um, you don't. You, you comply. But everything that happened to me was recorded. So I was always told as a young child at 15, if I ever told my parents, they would show them the videos and that my parents would lose their jobs and then we'd become homeless and it would be my fault. And at 15, I believed that. And then as you go along, they, the a trafficker will play this game of, I love you, love you, I'm going to give you everything. And then, oh, I don't love you. So I'm going to take it all away. And you can't eat for a week. Or, you know, we love you, but we don't. So it just totally confuses the mind of the trafficked person. And then you get to the point where you just give up on living. Because you feel that obviously nobody values you and you aren't loved. Um, that it's easy to want to just commit suicide and get out. And, and I tried several times, but I obviously wasn't successful at it. Um, and I'm grateful for that because now I can share and I have to share. People need to wake up to this. There's so many resources to help when a child comes out of trafficking, if they're arrested and they're brought into a, a shelter or a, a home that focuses on trafficking but nobody pays attention to the grooming aspect. And that's my focus. And that's why I share my story of how I was groomed slowly and methodically by Carl's father, little by little gaining my trust by filling the voids of, I never had a brother. So he was the brother that I never had, not having the um, intimate relationship with my parents that, Maybe I would have had if my other sisters weren't having their needs met. I'm, I don't know how to explain that, but I know what he, you mean. And he still does just, voice. Yeah, he, they do. And, and, you know, a lot of parents today are constantly saying how busy they are. Yeah. Let me tell you, parents, you are not too busy to save your children from the horrors of this. Because yeah. just because Sherry is brave enough to share her story, you heard her saying, March is the day that I, is, is, is the month that I was rescued. That means everything is still alive mm -hmm. and well. The healing never stops. Yeah. The journey never stops the journey to healing and peace and that's why i want to talk, to talk about patience and grace because this is so important the, that's why she's focusing on this work because we both know me and sherry both know the power of prevention mm -hmm. prevention because once you are in the grooming it's very hard to get out because you're 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 in you're halfway in then you're trafficked and then the trauma begins and then the psychological games which right. you started to touch on the push and pull the carrot and the stick we all know these things that are used in psychology and training so you have to really pay make a choice is your work more important because the healing journey never ends and she mentioned something very important many never leave this kind of situation alive mm -hmm. she said i was one of the lucky ones but she also said something very painful actually she said i tried to commit suicide several times mm -hmm. so we need to also be thankful to the people sharing their stories because she can go into details but we don't want you know you relive through you, you know you, you know we have to also be sensitive here because it takes a lot of bravery a lot of commitment, a lot of healing. To even sit here and talk for this long is very commendable. So parents, this is done from a place really of concern and care for the children mm -hmm. and sharing her story 
it's for you but don't just take it lightly your children like she said they're recruiting many children she didn't say a few children she said many so i really hope if you listen to this like please don't ignore it no. million millionaires their children are also trafficked it's from extreme poverty to rich healthy people are trafficked it's not a joke Mm -hmm. and and maybe sherry you can share some of the red flags you know the red flags that parents can see in their children's life you touched on some the children are alone in their room locking themselves in their room they don't want to engage with their parents you know they feel they're not loved enough there is no connection but if you could just let the parents know verbatim like you know make it plain sometimes there is nothing specific but things that you could look for is that your child might have an additional cell phone they have new clothing items that you know you did not buy them or you know they were dressed in one outfit when they went to school and they've come home in a different outfit they have new friends that the child won't let you meet um gosh they are asking to go to people's homes that you don't know and they won't the child won't let you contact the parents there's um, children that just want to be on social media more and more and more, uh, and they want to be on the chat features. Uh, somebody, uh, traffickers get to children through online games, through the chat features. So a child who maybe enjoys Roblox or Minecraft, and we're talking young children, um, they can be groomed through those apps by just asking a child to send a picture, maybe not necessarily meeting with someone, but can you send me a naked picture? Uh, oh, yes. In gaming? In gaming? If it has a chat feature, absolutely. They can go, anything that has a chat feature can have private chat rooms. And oh, a young, I'm just thinking of how many children I know who are gaming right yeah. now yeah please go yeah. on i'm sorry i just went like Hoo -hoo. i know <laughs> i'm serious i went like Hoo. okay you think about okay so again a groomer and a trap the groomer who's doing the part to prepare the child is using every resource possible to get to a kid so where are kids kids are online kids are playing games kids are at the mall kids are shopping they're going to be where the children are and that includes the game. So let's you know, say your child's playing a game and they're wanting to play more often. Oh, I just need to complete this level or I complete this level. Um, yeah, and a lot of young childs even, I'm not just to say to minimize just an image, but a child may realize, oh, I sent a picture to this person and they know inside it wasn't right, but they're going to be afraid to tell mom and dad. Yeah. They will be afraid to tell them. So parents need to say, seriously, if someone asks you for anything, nude, your feet, anything, a picture, just a picture in general of anything, please don't do it and tell us it, that that communication with the kids needs to be there because you're, a parent is fighting against just the normality of a teenager who thinks their parents don't know anything um to all of the environment of school and all the children are being exposed to in school through their friends to um somebody who's trying to groom them so if a parent thinks that their child tells them everything they're foolish a child does not tell the parent everything that's going on and oh, and uh, yeah and parents, yourselves, when you were teenagers, did you tell your parents? That? I know, right, right. I mean, parents, you need to really get a grip on things. Like, right. get out of your little, <laughs> I don't know what to call it. Think of yourself when you were a teenager. Not, it, does, it hasn't really changed. It's, it's, it's just no. what's it's changed in a different way. And right. social media has made it more complex yes. and provided more. They're right in your home. You right. know, back in the day, you had to go out. It was more complicated. You know, parents now. have a tough job. 
they have a really tough job because with with the internet, social media apps, online games, there's always a new app coming up and being developed. So children are moving from one app to the other, to the other, to the other. And groomers are right there along with them. And it's hard to figure out these apps, especially if maybe you're in a generation where social media was just coming in. And so you don't really understand how apps work or, or a particular app works because these kids, this is the generation they're in. They figure these things out very quickly and they know all of the features and mom and dad don't know them. So it's really just about, Hey, you know, you got to get, you got to get the phones, you got to get the apps, you got to get the tablets. You have to have all of that to um, kind of control it. You're the parent control, control that stuff as much as you can. Cause you're the, you're the, the gatekeeper of their safety. Exactly. There really are people like it's, you know, I wish they could know the seriousness of this stuff. It is so serious. And um, I'd like you to um, share with us some of the resources that are available. Should someone suspect, because, you know, we are using the terminologies and language that we are used to. In, in the everyday life, I don't think people are going to be like, oh, my God, I think this is grooming happening. You right. know what right. I mean? They're probably right. saying, I don't like what my child is doing on the Internet, you know, but right. we know these terminologies. And that's another thing, like, I'd like us sometimes to demystify these languages because no, very few people are going to be like, oh, human trafficking is happening in my home. Nobody's going to say that. You know what I mean? So can you share some of the resources, you know, speaking from the perspective of how a parent or somebody who's not in the know doesn't have the vocabulary or the language can speak to the, you know, I don't know, the police or the, the nonprofits or organizations such as yourself. What, what can they, what should they identify without using the words grooming or trafficking and then communicate this to the right you know, to the right um, officials and, you know, okay. players right. or organizations. Mm. I, I always think that parents need to trust their intuition. If they feel something isn't right with their child, something's not right with their child. I would first try and go to the child and find out what's going on. You're not acting the same. I love you. I care about you. We need to talk about this because people might be trying to hurt you. And, and to try to open up a conversation with them. If they're resistant to that, it's very important, obviously, to educate yourself on the signs of grooming and trafficking, which you can do at my website. Um, and every country has their own resources. All you got to do is you could just search like signs of grooming, signs of trafficking. They will not know that word. They will not. They'll be searching. You know, they're searching different stuff. Like, well... Well, it's like, how can you say, okay, my child's acting weird? Exactly. <laughs> but this is how people talk. My child is acting weird, is in the room. What you have to find the right, you know, yeah. and we're trying to help you parents. We have the vocabulary, we have the language, we know who to contact. But I think sometimes, Sherry, when, when people are in this work, we forget that the layman out there, they have never heard the word grooming, some of them. Well, I think they need to learn what that word means. Mm -hmm. because it's something that their child might encounter. I think they, under, they need to understand what that means because it will give them more power to be able to identify what might be happening to their child rather than just say, okay, my child is acting weird. Well, that could be just the fact that they're 13, 14, 15, 16. A lot of those children, because of hormones, they do weird things. But if you sense that something is not right, you need to become educated on what grooming is so that you are equipped to spot the potential signs of grooming and become accustomed to that word because it's basically molding the child. It's like taking a child and it's preparing them for sale. So, Parents need to learn what that word means. 
it's and not it can also happen peer to peer because we talked mm -hmm. about the 13 and the 40 year old so we want please parents it can also be peer to peer can you talk a little bit about this peer to peer grooming because you yeah. might just say, oh these are just you know jack's friends and mary's buddies you know and grooming is happening in your living room right absolutely so grooming can happen among peers if a and this didn't happen to me. I, I wasn't responsible for grooming other children. But if a child is being trafficked and they are still attending school, the trafficker will use the child, much like how Carl's father used Carl, to mm -hmm. find other kids. So the trafficker will say, let's say, Mary, Mary, you're doing such a great job and I know you love all the things that I buy you and I'll buy you even more things or I know you really want this purse or this outfit. Can you bring some of your friends to the next party? Wow. And so that that opens the door to having Mary invite more friends to the party and then that grooming process of those kids can begin outside of Mary doing the grooming, but she's the one that's the facilitator. So that is happening in our schools. If there is, and, and, and parents, it's, it's foolish if you don't think that there are children in every school across this world that's not being groomed, then that, you know, you're mistaken because they're, that these children are in our schools. I mean, I went to school Monday through Friday and I was trafficked on the weekends and over the summer. So this is the reality. And, you know, it took me a good, I'd say almost 20 years before I even had the courage to talk about this. It's hard. People come to me and say, well, why didn't you just walk away? And it's not that easy when somebody has control of your mind. And that's the ultimate goal that they want is they want to control your mind. And then they start controlling every aspect of just survival. Like we mentioned, food, water, things like that. So you become totally different. You're going. You don't have the resources. No, you have, you have no money. You have no money. Okay. Right. So okay. this is what they are wanting our kids for. Yeah. And it's our parents, it's a parent's job again, like I said, to be that gatekeeper to keep them safe to the best of their ability. Because what I don't want to do is ha if this happens to a child, that the parent blames themselves because there are forces that are outside of what's in the sight of a parent. Yeah. But if you can give parents enough tools by learning what grooming is and what it means and to be able to spot some of it, you might be able to intervene. If you don't, there are places that can help you in resources. And, you know, of course your police and every country has shelters and places for, for kids that do come out of trafficking. The, what I'm not trying to do is ever blame a parent. I don't blame my parents. I look back and I just I realize how busy parents are and even more so now that it's hard to be a parent. So I'm just trying to provide a tool and resources to add to all the other resources they may have to protect their children in, in a tough world um, and encourage parents to ask questions ask somebody who might be a survivor like myself. Well, and that's what's happening. So that I mentioned that 13 year old girl, parents are starting to come to me and they're asking me, this is what my child's doing. What do you think? And then I'll ask some questions. And I said, I think we need to get the police involved. Uh, and then they can take it from there. Um, because a lot of times that's parents- a good idea. Just plain and simple asking lots of questions if you're unsure but you know like you said use your you know you have a very good intuition and, a, and as a parent you just can sense things about your children so when you have this gut feeling something is off with little mary just ask questions you know ask 
ask as many questions and just research what could this lead to, what could be happening, and you'll get some good answers. That's a good, a good, an easy thing everybody can do. Ask questions. You won't look stupid and nobody's blaming you. Trust me. Yeah. There, these are sophisticated networks. The traffickers are not stupid. And mm -hmm. people who are trafficked are not stupid people. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I want to, I can't say it enough. They're not ignorant. They're not naive. They're not stupid. They didn't do anything to cause it, bring it upon themselves. They were none of that. It's none of that. No, no. Sophisticated yeah, network. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Well, and, and I need to share with people too, because when, when I talk to parents, they envision, oh, a traffic child is someone that is walking the streets, maybe in their red light district. There are those, but that's very few. Most children that are being trafficked are never on the street. I never walked a street. I was always sold in hotel rooms, in homes, or other places behind closed doors. I was taken there. I was never on the street. So I need people to understand that the, the vision that media and movies has portrayed forever and ever and ever is that they're hookers walking the streets yes. that they're every child that's trafficked is abducted mm -hmm. and that's not the case and um that there's a giant armed forces that's going to be able to come and rescue your child mm -hmm. and that it always happens somewhere else you know, parents need to understand that that's just not the case. The movies have done a really poor job at helping. Yes. They've done more harm than good. Right, because it sends a narrative oh, message. No, 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 that is not my... <laughs> no, never. I, I believe them. <laughs> I know. And that's why, that's why I always speak out about that, because it's like, no, that's not the case. The majority of trafficked children know their trafficker pretty intimately and th they're still functioning in life they're you know my case may have been a little different where i was still going to school there are some that once they're in the trafficking world they do go and live with their trafficker uh, but i didn't that was not part of my story my journey and so I really, I have to speak out to shatter those images that Hollywood has put in people's minds that this is what, what it is and that children or adults choose to be in this. There are people that choose that profession, but for the most part, no, that, that's not it. They're, they are being trafficked through force, fraud, or coercion. And that's the definition of what it means to be trafficked. You're, you're being forced to do it, you're being coerced to do it, or through fraudulent reasons, you know, such as, hey, I'll buy you this car if you just, first of all, have sex with me, and then, oh, you know, my buddies just want to have sex with you too, and that's how a lot of women start getting trafficked. Um, so it, that could be a long-term relationship, and then all of a sudden, the guy realizes, hey, I can sell my, my girl, and make money off of her. And because she's already bonded, let's say with the boyfriend, and this happens, it can happen with the minors, but it it's more with the adults, but this is a big, dark world. And we can't say it enough. And, and it, it, I'm sorry, it's not all love and light. No. And the solution is not all love and light. I'm sorry. I know people want to hear this, Sherry, because people are desperate for good news. For We want to win so bad. We want to break. It's all too heavy, but it yeah. requires participation. And to participate, yeah. you also have to have the knowledge and the awareness so that you understand what you're looking at, so Correct. that you can identify it. And you yeah. can't do this thinking, oh, love and light. You know, I'm there sorry. is. I don't like to, you know, bust the no. bubble, but it, yes. it's not getting us. We we cannot be like this. You know what I mean? And when you were talking about your boyfriend, and then the, you know, then how he he slowly, you know, you know, my 
with my friends and all this stuff. This is also what affects the rate of persecutions. You know, because she's really in love. A lot of the traffic survivors still have a soft spot for their traffickers. Call it Stockholm Syndrome or whatever, but they do have a soft spot. And when it comes to the evidence, it's very difficult because when the judge is asking questions and the you know the lawyers are asking questions, they ask, "Was he ever good to you? Did he really?" He said he took care of you and he fed you. Did he do this? You say yes. Mm -hmm. You know, did he buy you the clothes you wear? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Did he pay for your rent? Yes. <laughs> So it, a lot of cases crumble because of lack of evidence. The, 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 the court system is looking at hard evidence. Right. And that's why grooming, that's why we focus on prevention people, because when you get out, it's such a process. The, pers the persecution, you may never get justice, really. Right. I never you may get justice. never get justice. And even going to court, you may never reach there, because that's a whole different conversation for another show. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Sherry, if, I, I want to respect your time as well, but if you could touch real quick on legislation and uh, policies, because I know you're working on something very interesting at the moment. With, right. Uh, yeah, with that. And then uh, if you could just um, tell my little crafty self um, the secret behind the beautiful um, posters and pictures. Oh, them. yeah, absolutely. So... Um, I am very, so I, I am located in Arizona in the United States. So I'm very involved with our lawmakers. So we have a, a law that is going through our house and Senate to hopefully get on the Arizona ballot to go before the voters so they can decide if someone who is an adult that sells or buys a minor for exploitation, sex, um, labor, etc., any type of trafficking, that they will be given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. So I, I speak out before the House and the Senate, and I testify to try and get some of these laws passed. We're working really hard on this. We're going to, we're still waiting. Uh, we don't know, but I'm very involved in the legislative process because that's where we, at least if we can get some solid laws to protect our kids, then we have a foundation to be able to enforce them because right now some judges are very lenient and they will often give those that buy a minor a fine and let them go home. And I, I don't agree with that because my sentence is for life. I will not be free of the trauma and um, just not only the physical damage, the 12 surgeries I've had to have to repair my body until I die and go home to see the Lord. I have a life sentence. So I feel that they should be held accountable. And Usually, then, most trafficked um, survivors never report. So we no. don't really know in reality how many people this person has trafficked or abused or groomed or exploited. No. You know, the numbers are very underreported you know what that's I mean? why I, yeah i don't rely on statistics if somebody yeah. says statistics that's just based on the people that have been reported or that are sharing their story there are so many people out there that are being trafficked that yeah. unidentified yeah absolutely and there is no there is no number for them in the statistics because they don't know about them yeah. So, but anyway, I do a lot of amazing things with Pearl at the mailbox. Like I, I do speak out, I share about grooming and how I was groomed. I did write my book called Pearl at the mailbox showing the grooming process that's available on Amazon. I, um, work with the pregnant survivors. I'm a trauma informed birth doula. So when we get a pregnant oh, survivor, doula. I am, I oh. am. That so, is a magical job. I have three. <laughs> I have three. Doula is something just so special. And it's so different from childhood, but that's why you're seeing me grinning here because mm -hmm. we could talk for another five hours about, you know, I'm about to pull a tantrum about the horrible <laughs> buffing process. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, when I meet it, when I hear a doula, I'm like, wow. <laughs> Because life is precious. And what but also the buffing experience, it's being done all wrong. Yeah. 
It's insane. Yeah. We're gonna go, Sherry. Yeah. You so, so about nice the small team. Well. We we work with the shelters here in Arizona. And so when we're informed that they have a survivor that's come in that's pregnant, our team goes down and supports that um, mama and and works with them to prepare them for birth because their births are usually very very traumatic. Yeah. And so when they go into labor, we are with them at the hospital or the birthing center so that we can educate the medical staff on her history so they can be prepared for the bizarre reactions that happen when the baby is born. A lot of moms initially reject the baby because they don't, maybe they don't know who the father is or they've been in denial about their pregnancy the whole time. And then, you know, seriously, just vaginally giving birth is very traumatic for a survivor. So then, so we, we stay in that whole process and then we follow that mom for a year and mentor her. And then, and then, like I said, we've also started our intervention program. If people have questions, they're concerned about their children, but they're not sure if they should involve the police, then I can hear and listen to them. I, I will go and talk to the child, find out stories if the child will listen and I'll share my story. And then um, I have resources here in Arizona so I can share with them where to go. And then of course, all this stuff behind me, there's um, of course, amazing graces because God put Pearl in my path. And by the grace of God, I am, I am saved and rescued and able to share my story and then I, I just make I make a lot of diamond paintings. And so there's a lot of things that are therapeutic for me yes. that I, I need to have as a way to be creative and express myself. But the outcome is beautiful. And so I started doing these diamond painting crafts. Um, and then I sell them at, at fairs and stuff mm. just to raise money for um, my nonprofit. Oh, you sell them at, at fairs. OK, so they're not I online. Do. No, they're, they're not online. What we're doing right now for the month of March, myself and my assistant, is we're doing um, we're doing the pearl bracelets. So I, I don't know if you can see them, but oh, they can. Those are nice. Those are beautiful. So it's pearl because I always when I when I speak in the public, I always say everybody can be a pearl. Everybody can be a pearl by just paying attention to what's going on around you. And if you see something that seems wrong, call the police. It doesn't mean you have to get involved, but just pay attention. It's better that you get something wrong than go home and gosh, did I think maybe that girl was in a bad situation with that older man? Maybe I should have done something. So we have our fundraiser this month and it's um, bringing Pearl with you. So we have these little Pearl bracelets for the month that we're selling online. And that is only in uh, Arizona. You, you... It's in the U.S. Yeah. It's in it's in the U.S. Um, I think to ship it would be really expensive. But if I ever come out to see you, I'll bring yes. some. I mean, I you know I hope to get into Europe at some point and start sharing my story. I do travel across the United States a lot, but mm -hmm. this needs to be shared everywhere. And um, yeah. But you know, you know, you know, this is happening everywhere, and we have listeners from everywhere. So even in Africa, they're listening. So please, I <laughs> yes, 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 yes. They're yes. listening in Africa here in Scandinavia. Yes, of course. But they're listening. Yes. <laughs> this is again the beauty of you know the internet. You know, yes. the internet is a double edged yes. sword. We gotta love it too. We'd never have met. You know. No. No. You know, so we have to also give it gratitude. Right. <laughs> gratitude. Right, right. And I love pearls. Do you know the story of pearls? Pearls are amazing. They're fascinating. And how they become a pearl? Yeah, through the oyster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not a, a, it's a, it's not a painless process. You know? Yeah, that, that's what I, I heard. So when that's they're enjoying true. this beautiful pearl, it's just like a diamond. It's not a... Yeah. Know, well, she was one of a kind. She ended up getting um, dementia and didn't remember me, but I did go and visit her as often as I could before she passed and went home to the Lord. Uh, but I guess maybe in my way, I'm trying to be a pearl by speaking out 
and um, paying attention. And that's what I encourage others to do. We can make such a positive impact in just watching what's going on around us if we just yeah. do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sherry, for joining us. Everybody, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Please visit the website. We will put everything in the description bar, um, the description section. Everything is going to be there. You know, we didn't go through her whole bio. You know, we never do that because we don't want to take too much time. The women mm. we have over here, they have pages of bios. Okay. <laughs> so if we're still going through the bios, we'll take a lot of time. It will take a lot of time and they have a lot to share and we don't want to take too much time. You know, nowadays we, we, I know our listeners would love us to leave the, you know, make the interview a TikTok size interview but it's not possible because the information has to be you know it has to be detailed because right. we're talking about life here you can't do a microwave there's no microwave solution to the seriousness of what has been shared today and i think we've tried our best to put a lot into one hour so yes. um we hope we have helped you all um when you watch this um amazing conversation thank you sherry again this is your story is something and you know when i think of a 15 year old i know many 15 year olds you know they're really babies you know you know maybe we, we we're looking at a grown woman and we're forgetting the stories from a 15 year old girl mm -hmm. you know and i'm thinking of a 15 year old girl it's it's intense I know it is intense. I used to have a picture up that I would share with people like, okay, this is when I was 15, but on my website, uh, okay. there is a section that shows me and you would never know. Um, it was actually my high school, senior high school picture. So at that time I was almost 18. You would never know by looking at me that I was being trafficked, but you can certainly, I can see personally the innocence and the, Oh gosh, what do I say? Vulnerability in, in that picture. I see it. So it's there. Your inner child. Yeah. Yeah. But thank you so much for this opportunity. I really thank appreciate you so much. it. And I hope you will come back. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll connect later. Thank you to all our listeners out there. Please make sure to go to the website and connect. Just, you know, take your time and learn as much as you can learn because it will help you identify things quicker, understand what you're looking at. Okay. Thank you so much and goodbye.